is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to the second episode in season two of Lawyer On Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today I am joined by Mitsuru Claire Chino, who is the Managing Executive Officer of Itochu Corporation, a Fortune Global 500 company headquartered in Japan. She is also President and CEO of Itochu International Inc., a subsidiary of Itochu in New York, overseeing North America. Claire has been based in New York the past four and a half years. Before assuming her position in New York, she was general counsel of Itochu and prior to that, a partner with an international law firm. In 2013, Claire got into the history books, becoming the first female executive officer of any major trading company in Japan. She was also the youngest employee to hold such a high-ranking position in a major trading house. Claire was born in the Netherlands, had some time in London, and grew up in Japan, and later moved to Los Angeles. And then she came back to Tokyo, where I think it was where I met Claire, I recall, at a Foreign Women's Lawyers Association event. Claire has received several recognitions, including from the World Economic Forum as a Global Leadership Fellow and a Young Global Leader, from Yale University as Yale World Fellow, from Asia Society, Asia 21, and from the US Japan Foundation as US JLP Fellow. Not unsurprisingly, Claire has also been recognized in the legal community as a top 25 in-house counsel in Asia by Asia Legal Business, Asia Pacific's innovative lawyer by the Financial Times, and the FT also recognized Claire as FT Global General Counsel 30. And she also received a Transformative Leader Award from Inside Counsel. In 2018, the California Lawyers Association recognized Claire as the eighth annual Warren M. Christopher International Lawyer of the Year. And most recently, she became the recipient of the Smith Medal from Smith College. Claire is a graduate of Smith College with a BA cum laude and received a JD from Cornell Law School where she now serves on their advisory board. If you know Claire, then you know that she is a classically trained singer and gives solo performances from time to time. I've had the pleasure of seeing Claire singing and I hope to have that chance again after the pandemic. Claire also recently wrote a chapter in Rika Nakazawa's book, Dear Chairwoman. And if you have not already gone and bought that book, I hope you do because... Claire touches upon the topics we will also go into further today. Claire is an example of how you can get really high up in your career as a lawyer, all the way up to leading a global corporation and executing at the highest levels, yet still remain grounded and humble. I am very pleased to be able to bring Mitsuru Claire Chino to you as my guest today. Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Catherine, for such a kind introduction. Uh, It's great to hear your voice. Wonderful to hear you and to see you again. It's just been great. And today we're going to be talking about lots of topics, your early days in the Netherlands and London and time in the U.S. studying and working, what brought you into the law, uh, landing that trailblazing position at Itochu and your transition to your CEO role. I'd also like to talk about mentoring and sponsors, your passion for singing, and I'd love you to share your nuggets of guidance for young lawyers and what they should be thinking about in their careers in law and beyond. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. And I guess I'm not young anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I just said you were because I saw you. You are ageless. You are ageless. We are young at heart as well, I have to say. That's correct. Yes. Correct. And today we're talking online, Claire, as you are in New York in the early morning and I'm here in the evening in Tokyo. And I guess if we were meeting up in person, where do you think we would be? Do you have a favorite 
wine bar or cafe or restaurant that you would love to go to either there or here? And what would be your choice of beverage off the menu? So um, I'm actually very excited that uh, New York City is coming back. Uh, as, I, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm actually looking at the Hudson River. But uh, the other day, they were actually filming uh, the sequel to Sex and the City right in front of my office. No! And, uh, so, of course, that led me to go back and binge watch all those, you know, Sex and the City episodes. And I realized for the first time that uh, Carrie Bradshaw is really into Cosmopolitan, the cocktail. So one of the things that uh, I have been doing recently is going around, uh, you know, actually looking for bars that would serve good Cosmos. So next time, you know, you're in the city, Catherine, that's what I would like to be drinking with you. And hopefully by then I can find a really nice, elegant hotel bar in New York. Wow. Wow. I cannot wait for that. And yes, I remember watching those old episodes and you've got me thinking I'm going to have to go back and look at them as well. They had beautiful martini glasses, didn't they? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And they looked so good. um, And I love the name. So yes, it's a deal. I'll, I'll do that with you anywhere, anytime, but hopefully in New York. Yes. Thank you. And so you and I have known each other for a number of years now. And I remember being in utter awe of you when I met you at FWLA, the Foreign Women's Lawyers Association. And I think at the time I was the membership lead and I'd come back to Tokyo to work for Hogan Lovells. And at our events, I was on the reception desk checking people in and, and you were a fairly regular attendee and speaker. Do you remember those days at FWLA? I really do. I do. It was actually uh, one of the first organizations that I joined after coming back to Japan. So I spent time in San Francisco and then returned to Japan. And it was really a wonderful you know, organization to meet people, make great friends like yourself, and just stay connected and have this you know, community outside of your regular work. And for me, my regular work was Itochu Corporation, a very Japanese corporation, which I, you know, of course, like very much. But it was just so wonderful to be able to speak in English and have these powerful female lawyers. And it was a wonderful uh, event. Sure. And I mean, Foreign Women's Lawyers Association was also inclusive. It was open to men and there were all kinds of different people who joined those. But it really was a community for foreign women's lawyers and for Japanese lawyers coming together, foreign qualified lawyers as well, right? So yes, yeah, I remember that very well. And also I recall in 2012, when I came back to in-house for an APAC role leader of uh, head of legal, I asked you to support my company's membership application for the Kei Hōyukai, the association. Oh my goodness. I had forgotten about that. that. (laughs) Do you remember that though? That was 2012. Yes. But I do remember that. Yes, very well. So I, you know, you said yes without hesitation. And I thought, although you and I actually around the same age at the time, you were really, I felt like you were miles ahead in career. And I think back on that now and think I was pretty bold to ask you to do that for me. But you do remember that. that time. Of course, very well. And <laughs> it was actually, you know, I didn't think that it was a bold move at all. Uh, it was a, a natural thing for you to become a member of uh, of the whole UK. Thank you very much. It's really such a pleasure today. So Let's go back and talk about your early days and then get into your substantial career path. But in those early years, you were in Netherlands. And I I don't think I knew the story about you, how you came to be born in the Netherlands. So it was actually up to my parents, I suppose. My father was an international businessman and he was posted in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Uh And so, you know, my parents were living there as uh, newlyweds and that's where I was born. I'll tell you an interesting story. So I think I may have been one of the first Asian or certainly of Mongolian descent babies Wow! born in the Netherlands or in, in Rotterdam at this particular hospital. And you probably know this, but Japanese babies and Mongolian you know, babies, they have this uh, bluish mark on their butt. I have heard this. Until they're about two or three. And, and of course, therefore, we have this Japanese word, aonisai meaning blue two-year-old, to describe somebody who is immature. But it's actually, it comes from a physical characteristic of this particular, I don't know if race is the correct word or not, but anyway, Japanese babies have these, uh, oftentimes, uh, these bluish, uh, bruise-like uh, things. I was the first baby born at the particular hospital with that bluish thingy. 
And the doctors got really excited because they had never seen it in person, but only in books. And uh, to my mother's dismay, the doctors went around showing my, my behind <laughs> to the hospital staff. So, so that's how I was born in the Netherlands. Wow, you started out with a bang. <laughs> That is very funny. Um, wow, famous from the get-go. That's incredible. I always ask my guests, you know, what they wanted to be when they were a child. So I'm curious to know what that was for you, what you wanted to be, and then how you got to be interested in being a lawyer. And I think your father's work may have had some influence there. Sure. So I always loved singing, but I also loved writing. Uh, when I was a child, I wanted to become a, a writer, a novelist. At the age of 14, my father was posted to Los Angeles, and so we moved from Japan to Los Angeles, and uh, it was really during the, um, the economic war between the U.S. and Japan, uh, just like, I guess, uh, what we're facing between the U.S. and China. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, and of course, you know, being uh, an executive with a car company, uh, my father was uh, called as a witness to many lawsuits in Los Angeles. And that really exposed me to the legal world in the U.S. quite early on. That eventually led me to wanting to become an international lawyer to maybe bridge the gap between U.S. companies and Japanese companies. So that's how I ended up going to law school eventually. Did you hear the stories from your dad or did you see him in action in the courts or how did you get to know about him as a lawyer as well as you being your dad? I met many of the lawyers uh, who were representing my father's company. I would see them at parties. So, and I actually interned at uh, one of these law firms uh, when I was a college student. So I, your lawyers were around me quite a bit, which was actually something that uh, I had never experienced in Japan prior to that. I think, you know, living in Japan as an ordinary person, you don't come across lawyers that much. Uh, Catherine, in your, in your work, in my work, we come across lawyers all the time. But for an ordinary person, I don't think, you know, meeting a lawyer on a daily basis is something that is a common thing in Japan. But uh, in Los Angeles in the 80s, there were all these lawyers, international lawyers around me. I think the law became something very close to me. I see. So then you did get very much interested in international law. And so your first law job was, in fact, an international law firm, wasn't it? And what kind of work did you end up doing there? And how did you progress through to partnership? So I don't know how many of the listeners remember what the, the 1991 was like. Catherine, <laughs> I'm sure you remember. I remember. I do. Uh, the, the economy here in the United States wasn't uh, very good. In fact, it was horrible. When the economy is bad... Bankruptcy lawyers and litigation lawyers, they thrive. And I graduated from law school in 1991, and I wanted to do more cross-border M&A work. But that kind of work was very scarce. And so when I joined a firm called Graham & James, uh, which is now Squire Patent Boggs, they only had uh, a position for me in the litigation department. And while Graham & James uh, was an international law firm, the office that I joined in Newport Beach, California, was very small, of about 13, 14 lawyers. Uh, I was the only first-year associate uh, in that office that year. And because they were so busy with bankruptcy and litigation cases, I was assigned to uh, handle litigation. And because they were so busy, oftentimes I would actually go to the court by myself or to handle actually lawsuits by myself. Uh, I tried probably two or three trials my first year. That was actually a very exciting experience. But I always wanted to turn to transactional law. So the opportunity came about when I was transferred from the Newport Beach office of Graham and James to Hong Kong, because at that time, Graham and James had a partnership with a, a firm called Deacons uh, in Hong Kong. It was Deacons, Graham and James. And I was seconded uh, from Graham and James to Deacons. And in Hong Kong, uh, I started to do work for Japanese companies uh, with presence in Hong Kong and China, including Itochu Hong Kong. So Itochu uh, was a client of ours, and I got to work with Itochu for the first time in Hong Kong, which eventually led me to being seconded to Itochu Corporation's legal department in Tokyo, 
And then I finished this convent, moved to San Francisco, and uh, was made partner of Graham and James in San Francisco. Oh, I see. So I didn't realize you had that stint with Itochu as a second. It really helped me. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I know that uh, many law firms uh, in Japan have a secondment programs with uh, their clients, uh, both international and domestic. I think it's a fantastic experience to be exposed to the, the clients early on. In my case, I was a fourth year associate. And just having started transactional law, mm. I really didn't really know how to draft things or, but, you know, being inside Itochu, I had to really tackle many issues. Uh, of course, not by myself. Oftentimes, I would uh, seek advice uh, from the, the Tokyo office of Graham and James and to have the backup. But uh, I think it was a great experience to be exposed to the clients, to really know what they're concerned about, what they're expecting from lawyers, and also uh, on things like billing, uh, how they actually go through invoices from law firms, how they check timesheets, things like that. So those experiences actually helped me when I returned to private practice later on. Brilliant. Well, it's one thing going on secondment, and I agree with everything you've said, secondments are are like uh, gold, really. And I think everyone who has a chance should try. So it's one thing to go on secondment, but actually to join that company as an employee is another thing. And so I believe you then did around, is it February 2000, you did actually join Itochu. And is that by invitation from them? How did that go about that you got to join them eventually as an employee? So I became partner of Graham and James in January of 99, I believe. Right. And right after that, the firm started having discussions, merger discussions with other firms. I see. And Graham and James uh, was a law firm that I spent my summers with. I was a summer associate there. I never really thought about any other law firm than Graham and James. And I really liked the Graham and James culture. I wasn't so sure what the, the firm culture was going to be like after the merger. And also living in San Francisco, it's a great city. But uh, by that time, all my family members had returned to Japan. Mm. So I was looking for ways to get back to Japan. And that's when Itochu called me and said, uh, would you like to come join us? So it was a great opportunity for me to, to move from San Francisco back to Tokyo and into the legal department of Itochu. Wow. And did you imagine you would stay with them for, what is it, 17 no. years now? No, I had, no, no, I didn't. In, in fact, it, it's a funny story because uh, people thought I was crazy leaving Graham and James or leaving a, a private law firm to be with a Japanese company in Japan because I, on the surface, gave up a lot of things. So, for example, my salary cut was probably about 30%. Mm -hmm. Like a, a typical Japanese company, Itochu didn't have any offices. So I was sitting in an open floor plan when I had a really nice office in San Francisco. Uh, of course, no secretary, uh, none of, and, and no title. So, you know, uh, going from a partner to just a, an ordinary employee within Itochu. So people thought I was crazy. Why are you doing that? But um, what I really liked about Itochu was the fact that they was engaged in so many different businesses all around the world. So for me, it was really about the businesses, the opportunities to be closer to, to all these transactions. But as you say, I didn't think that I would be here uh, in 2021. <laughs> and you are. And you are. That's amazing. And the person who invited you to come and work, was that the same person that you had worked with during your yes. secondment? Yeah, he was actually ah. the scariest client. <laughs> Whenever I received phone calls from him as a young lawyer in a law firm, uh, I would get very nervous because he always had these very difficult questions. And I still remember I would uh, get a phone call from him. Not so much email communication, right, Catherine, back then. So, you know, oftentimes exactly. these communications were phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> so I would receive a phone call and I would jump mm. up and actually would respond to those phone calls standing, I remember. But he's the one who ultimately invited me back. Uh, he really became my mentor as well as my sponsor. I, I know that uh, these are topics that uh, we'll get into a little bit later, but he definitely helped me out 
Oh, wow. He's the sponsor and mentor. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. And do you think you were actually interviewing for the position while you were on secondment then with him in reality? I don't think so. Oh. I don't think, no, because, um, and I don't think he had the notion either of uh, hiring anybody. And so it had been, what, four, five years since, since my secondment. Okay, but he remembered you, of course. He remembered me and we actually kept on doing uh, business together. And you, he became your sponsor and mentor, yes. as we will get into. And so you rose through the ranks there and you became a general counsel. And was that a natural progression then too? Or did a gap open up? No, not at all. But how did that come about? One of my deals that I wanted to make uh, very clear when I joined Itochu was that I wanted to be more like an independent contractor. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I joined Itochu, What's the Japanese word? It's um, anyway, it's it's somebody who does special projects. So I was I wasn't sitting in any of these islands. I, I was in the legal department, but I had my desk to myself, sort of off to the side, and I was assigned to special projects. And that's the way I liked uh, to work. I didn't want to have a boss or subordinate. After all, I thought I had been a partner. There's really nothing else that I want. And so I think uh, two years passed, and this this person who recruited me, he said, uh, Chino-san, I think it's about time that you actually became one of the, the team leaders for a team in the legal department, meaning that I was actually going to be joining these um, the hierarchical structure. I really didn't want to have that, as I said. But uh, he said, well, it's a hierarchical structure. Companies are structured that way, and you have to be part of that system. Mm. Uh, So I I still remember one April 1st, I became a team leader with six or seven subordinates, uh, which meant that uh, I had to review their work, also evaluate them. It's very different from the the partner-associate relationship in a law firm. Uh, It's actually more training, more educating, and it was quite stressful Mm. uh, because it's something that um, I didn't necessarily want myself to be doing, to be responsible for others' work. But I think uh, it really gave me the opportunity to care for uh, the team as well as the team members. Uh, It really led to how do you manage a team, and eventually then I became associate general counsel and general counsel where I had to manage, of course, the legal department. And what is actually quite interesting is that despite the fact that I don't think my work as a lawyer or my opinion as a lawyer changed over the years so much, within the organization, the perception or the how my voice was received really changed. So my opinion as somebody in the legal department is very different from an opinion of the head of legal. I realized that uh, by being part of the organization and, and in order to be taken seriously, you have to have that title and you should always strive for that title. Mm. And did, do you have a seat at the boardroom table as well, the management level as well as GC? So uh, one thing that uh, if any of you listeners are thinking about joining uh, a company in it, so in in-house position, you should really research where the legal department sits within the organization and what function it, it uh, serves. Because in Itochu's case, uh, the legal department is a very much part of the investment committee. So if there's a, a large enough project, the legal department, amongst other administrative uh, departments, such as the accounting or treasury, they have a say on whether they approve the project or not approve the project. Mm. And so you're very much part of the decision-making. So obviously, as GC of such an organization, yes, uh, my say actually uh, had, well, meant a lot uh, Mm. for the company and for those projects. Right. And so what did it take then to be a great general counsel? Well, according to the book of Mitsuru Claire Chino, what does it it take? And we're compiling a list of amazing uh, skills and areas. I I think, you know, having spent time in private practice really helped me. Right. Because I really saw the business people as our clients, uh, you know, our partners, but also our clients. 
meaning that we had to add value. Oftentimes, legal departments can be the last department that business departments come to for the final, you know, stamp of approval. But that's not, you know, the function that you want to have as the legal department. You have to add value, and. I think that kind of a mindset is something that I perhaps learned in in private practice, always being available for the clients, always trying to solve problems for them. And in fact, here, my my first mentor uh, really taught me quite a bit. And my first mentor is not this, this person that I've been talking about, but she is a partner or she was a partner of Graham and James in San Francisco. Uh, she's the one who actually sponsored me to be a partner of Graham and James. But she was a fantastic problem solver. She could not only spot issues, but then she could come up with really creative solutions. And I really saw that to be something that I I wanted to strive for. I still remember that at the end of one of the closings that we had, a very difficult transaction uh, in San Francisco. Of course, you know, her clients uh, gave her flowers and were very appreciative. But the other side sent her flowers as well because they were so appreciative of the fact that she was able to create solutions for everybody's benefit. And I think, you know, having seen somebody like her, I wanted to bring those skill sets to an in-house organization as well. So maybe that's something that I I try to to do uh, within the legal department at Teach Yeah, that, that recognition from the other side. I think that says a lot, doesn't it? Because you're It does, it really does. You're meant to be opposing parties or getting to the best part of the deal and there they are. It's not the flowers themselves, it's that symbolizing of the fact that thank you did a great job, you got us to where we needed to be. What an amazing Absolutely. endorsement. Wow. Absolutely, yeah. Well, now you are managing executive officer for Itochu Corporation in Japan, yes. correct? And you have the dual role as president and CEO of Itochu international in New York overseeing North America. So those seem to me to be quite different roles overseeing different, perhaps different areas, different parts of the globe. So tell me a little bit more about those roles and what you do and uh, how many people report to you, those kinds of things. Sure. So maybe I'll I'll talk about uh, first how I was assigned to New York. Yes. So I was very, very happy as GC for Itoji Corporation. And one day I was called to one of the, uh, the director's offices and he said, uh, your, your next posting is New York. And it's not a legal position. <laughs> and I was quite surprised. Mm. And he said, uh, you're going to be the, the CAO, so the number two essentially, yes. uh, for Itochu International Inc. And I, I think he was worried that I would say no. Mm. I don't know why he. I don't know why he thought that. Maybe because he saw me as a legal person. But that's probably but, right. Uh, and, and definitely, I saw myself as a legal person. But one of the uh, things that I think is very important for especially women is to not forego chances. And if an opportunity came along, I was going to say yes. I t- I want to pursue that opportunity. So at the spot, I said, you know, I'm, I'm happily accept, excited to be the CAO. And that's how I moved to New York in 2017. Mm. And it was really a sort of a, an apprenticeship year for me to, I guess, for the company to see whether I was CEO material. Uh, right. So I served as CAO for one year and then became CEO the next year. I was tremendously worried because I was never good in math. I still don't know how to do Excel spreadsheets. Neither do I. (laughs) But I'll tell you, Catherine, (laughs) you don't really need to know how to make spreadsheets. I always thought that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't have to do all the calculation. You, You leave the calculation to those Excel gurus. Yes. And I think what you have to to really know, and it's something that you and I are both trained as lawyers, is to really understand uh, the gist of what these numbers may represent. And I think, uh, again, you know, issue spotting. So despite my initial fear, I'm actually finding that uh, the CEO position is something that somebody with a legal background probably has an advantage 
in, in order uh, in terms of making a good CEO because it's, it's understanding the issues. There are a lot of legal issues as well, especially in this day and age with COVID and also with the Biden administration here in the U.S., a lot of you know legislation, a lot of things coming out. And you have to understand them, the gravity of that, what you have to really pay attention to, what other risks which are minor to your organization that you can sort of forget about and make decisions. So, yeah, I'm actually thinking that uh, a lawyer turned CEO is a pretty good career path for anybody. Mm, Many would say not, but I also think that is a very big possibility. And I heard about another Japanese woman who is in in Japan and has been appointed as the CEO of 3M. Mm. And she is a, a lawyer as well. I don't know if you know her, but not yet. Hiroko Miyazaki. And so I believe she has also taken this path. So I'm seeing a trend, a start of a trend. And I think you've uh, laid the foundations for other lawyers to think about this, that you can be the CEO of an organization. That's amazing. And so your transition there to CEO is really fascinating because you also mentioned this in the chapter that you wrote uh, in the Dear Chairwoman book. And you talk about here this the need or the essentialness of having a sponsor uh, and yes. having somebody who looks after you in the organization. But I love how you wrote this. And let me just quote you. A sponsor is someone who can promote you up and in the organization. And I think you've used up and in very purposefully there because up the organization and in the organization seem like two different things to me. Is that true that that's how you're seeing that uh, sponsorship is a little bit different perhaps? Oh, absolutely. And the difference there for you with with mentors and why uh, you need both and the differences between them. Right. You have to be integrated into the organization uh, first before Mm. you are brought up, I believe. And I mean, I don't want to generalize between men and women, but certainly in my case, being a lateral hire into Itochu Corporation, which is quite rare for a Japanese company. And my initial reaction to being, I didn't want to be integrated into the organization, as I said, Uh, but you have to actually be integrated into the organization before you can start climbing up the, the corporate ladder. Right. And, and I think men are perhaps more socialized to be integrated into a particular organization, especially a Japanese corporation. And women, of course, still being the minority. Maybe they both, the organization as well as the women, uh, have a hard time sort of being integrated with each other. So a sponsor is somebody who uh, makes sure that uh, you have a seat at the table. So you're not sitting at another table, but you're actually all seated at the same table. And that's the integration part that I talk about. So it's sort of like, uh, you know, the Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, I guess, you know, but before you can lean in, you have to be at the table or right. the desk, right? So that's that's the in part. You had... Two critical sponsors. It sounds like you also had another person back in uh, at the law firm as well, but your first yes. sponsor, you said, promoted you to general counsel in the legal division, and then your second person uh, promoted you to this current position. So right. what are the sponsors doing? They're not just doing a one-off, oh, I think Claire should be CEO of Itochu International. Right, there you go. It must be over a, a period of time that the sponsor is promoting you. And perhaps there are times when you don't actually know they're doing that for you, or do you? I don't think they have these master plans. <laughs> uh, I, at least I'm not aware of those master plans. But I think um, it really boils down to really doing a good job on your daily basis. Mm. You know, I was invited to join Itochu because I was a good, doing a good job as a young lawyer, and he liked me. Uh, he saw me as somebody uh, who would be a, a good colleague of his a good subordinate of his. So he brought me in in the first place. Mm. And I hope that I continue to show that I was not only a good lawyer, but a benefit to the organization. So making decisions or even little things, just making those decisions for the good of the organization. 
And so maybe he saw that in me and the person who then promoted me to, to CEO here, I, I think maybe he saw the same thing. I handled a quite number of really sort of very large transactions for Itochu Corporation. And, and maybe he saw that I could handle the stressful situations very well. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think it really boils down to really doing your, your job on a daily basis in a positive way for the organization and also looking after your colleagues or teammates. Do you ask someone to be a sponsor or do they say, I'm going to be your sponsor? Is there a transaction there or how do you know that someone is your sponsor? So, so neither. But I think uh, if you want to have somebody become a sponsor of you, what you can do is not necessarily ask them officially whether they would be a sponsor, but start interacting with them, uh, maybe providing them with information that you might think uh, would be helpful. So for example, I'm sitting here in New York, and if there is a piece of information, whether it be the stock market situation or you know the Hurricane Ida, which hit the US quite badly, I know that all of those things are reported in Japanese newspapers too, but there are things or aspects that are not necessarily reported and you think that uh, that piece of information is important to whoever, you might want to take the initiative in reaching out and being of uh, an asset to them. Right. So it's, it's not, sponsor is somebody that you have to actually give something back as well. Mm. You know, I mean, it sounds so transactional, but for example, lawyers publish newsletters all the time, right? Correct. Like recent developments and whatever. Yes. Uh, why, uh, why do law firms do that? Of course, because they want to get new clients or uh, have existing clients come back to you. But that's not the only thing. I think they want to do something. They want to provide information that is of use to the clients. And I think this is the kind of same mentality that I perhaps brought in, well, um, that I'm using. Good, good. And then in terms of mentors and mentorship, that's a little bit different. How do yes. they help us to do better? Because in the book, again, you talk about how you believe it's really important for any person to have a mentor. And yeah. you describe a mentor as someone who can show you the way forward, someone that you aspire to be. Right. And you also referred to studies that have shown that someone who has a mentor tends to do better in the organization than one who does not. So why is this? And can you give your advice to people maybe who are thinking about trying to find a mentor, but they say they can't find someone? A mentor is somebody who could be your, your sound, uh, sounding board. And the reason why people with mentors tend to do better is because they can vicariously live through the mentor's successes and failures. So rather than trying out something for, your, for the first time by yourself, if you see a mentor having succeeded in doing something, having done something, then you can be confident enough to pursue that path. If you see a mentor having failed at something, uh, maybe it's something that you learned from the mentor's lesson too. It becomes your lesson. So you're not so afraid of taking the first step. The mentor has actually taken that first step for you. And I think it's really important to have somebody like that. In my case, the, the San Francisco partner that I had, she was definitely my mentor. Uh, she showed me the way. Uh, she also became my sponsor as well when she uh, recommended me for a partnership. So a mentor can be a sponsor as well, but uh, it's somebody who's not necessarily so senior to you or who may not necessarily be in the same uh, hierarchical line as you because uh, you don't want to ha- jeopardize the relationship either. You want to have an open conversation with these mentors who can tell you what may, have, uh, what may work, what may not work, and who may actually give you advice on how to interact with your, your boss. Because oftentimes I think in an organization, one of the things that uh, you might struggle with is if you have a boss that uh, you don't necessarily get along with, and how do you talk about that? You want to have a mentor who's not in the same line, uh, who might be able to look at things more objectively and give you great advice. And they often know a lot about that particular person who is your line manager as well, yes. right? so they can That's help right. you indeed. And so how should people go about finding somebody to be their mentor? Can they ask, is it good to be proactive and go and find a mentor? 
or yeah, join, a, a, join a program perhaps I know with women in law Japan we have a mentorship program and that's obviously an invitation for people to be mentor or mentee but if you're in an organization that doesn't have something like that can you ask somebody I would again like with a sponsor I don't think you go up to somebody and say can you be my mentor right I, I think uh, it starts with uh, small steps uh, yeah. Seeking advice, maybe inviting that person to coffee, right, or just a thirty-minute chat. I think it starts that way in a very informal setting, because if you are approached and by somebody and asked, "Can you be my mentor?" That that's a little bit too daunting, too too serious. So I think you have to mold the mentor, uh, the eventual mentor, to become a, your mentor. Uh, I think it starts with small, small steps. Right, small steps, yes. It is. It's just, you know, can you be my mentor? And the person may not know anything about you, seen any right. of your work, know anything about your personality. Uh, exactly. Do you get on well? Just knows that you're somebody in the organization. So that is great advice. I hope that's helpful for people because some say they don't know how, but then there's small steps. So it's not a big, a big question to somebody, but it's about taking time to get to know people and ask them and do things for them. I also want to stress the importance of organizations like the Foreign Women Lawyers Association and these organizations yes. that are out there. So they may not necessarily be mentors in the strictest of definition, but it's really important to have people uh, who may understand your situation. So it, women in the, the law profession, I know that I made two really good friends uh, through Foreign Women Lawyers Association, and I, I still seek advice from them and get great uh, advices. So mm. I don't think you should be thinking always that you have to have a sponsor or a mentor, but people that you meet through these organizations can be your great friends and great, I, I guess, mentors in, in a broad sense. Exactly. Great. And I'm going to ask you again, just align to that, but a little bit of a different topic, because I know that diversity on boards is also one uh, really passionate subject that you like to talk about. And tied into that, I thought it was very interesting, your uh, writing about individualism and how essentially we are all individuals with different layers and identities. And I was interested how perhaps individualism moves into diversity on boards and how we can bring that to diversity on boards. And with that, I also wanted to ask you about this Cornell advisory board role that you have. So first up, tell me a little bit about individualism, because I know you've written about that in the, the book that we talked about. I really found that fascinating. So in my case, I know that I, I became uh, executive officer of Itochu Corporation at the age of 46, which was considered to be very young. <laughs> Although it's not that young, it is. but uh, I think the the average age for one to become an executive officer, well, certainly at Itoji was around fifty two. Um, I know that uh, at some of the other trading companies, it may be older than that, fifty three, fifty four. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, you know, why is this forty six year old becoming uh, an executive officer? And certainly, my gender played a huge role. But it actually, in that sense, it helped me uh, become an executive officer. Had I been a man, would I have made executive officer at the same time? I just don't know. It was very interesting because um, the CEO then, who made me uh, the executive officer, he actually posted an intranet a message when I was announced to become executive officer saying that Ms. Chino is becoming executive officer, not because she's a woman, but uh, because she has been recognized by other communities like the World Economic Forum, this and that. Yes. And it was very, I was actually flattered. I thought that was a very sort of, you know, supportive, encouraging message. Interestingly, mm -hmm. there are people who didn't take it very well, uh, mm -hmm. women. They mm -hmm. thought that, why, why, did, why does he need to say that, that she's being made executive officer, not because she's a woman? But I think oftentimes, certainly the, slightly older generation, you and I, we become board members or become executive officers earlier on than men and to a certain extent because we are women. And how are you to think about that? Because I think one way to look at it is that, you know, I don't want to just be recognized as a woman. 
I have other qualifications and why are they not talking about that? And I, I think I came to the realization that certainly in my case, my gender played a role. And I think that's a fact. Uh, of course, other qualifications played a role. And you just have to acknowledge that. And maybe there are things that you can actually bring to the table because you're a woman. Not, not because you're a woman, but because you see things differently from the majority of the board members. I really do believe that people tend to make decisions based upon their own experiences. And your experience as a man could be very different from an experience as a woman. So as a result of that, your view could be very different depending on your upbringing. And in a Japanese company, if all of the, the men basically have similar upbringings, of course their, their outlook is going to be very similar. And your role as somebody who doesn't belong to that, uh, that category or, uh, or group is to perhaps bring a different view to the set of uh, you know, issues or whatever that you're facing. So I don't think you should necessarily be very nervous about the fact that you're asked to speak or become a, a board member, partly because you're a woman. I mean, recently I was actually asked to attend a, an international conference. Uh, it's a U.S.-Japan business conference. And the, the secretariat, especially from Japan, wanted to ask me to be part of that meeting. Because there were so few women attending. <laughs> uh, should, now, should I be offended by that? Um, I wasn't. I was actually, I thought, you know, mm. no, I, I'd be happy to speak. But having said that, the individualism is that, yes, uh, you are bringing a set of maybe different ideas from the rest, but it may not necessarily be something that is always centered around women's issues. You shouldn't think that you're invited to be a board member to always address diversity issues, although that is a something that is very important. Yes, I see. And also, I think in the book, you talk about uh, your gender is certainly an important aspect of who you are. Yeah. And it is also, though, crucial to remember that it's the voice of you as an individual that matters. Right, exactly. Exactly. Right. Because not of who you are, rather than it re represents a voice, not a female voice exactly, but a voice that matters. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. You can see I've been reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even remember what I wrote, so that's yeah, well, great. It's a, Thank it's you so much. Great. So <laughs> you, even if you didn't become a writer as yet and publish a, a book yourself, I don't think I've seen that. I think it's <laughs> certainly in your stars to do that. And then Cornell Advisory Board. You're yes. on the advisory board. And I know advisory boards are quite different to being an external director, for example. So how is that working for you? What kind of things do you do with the Cornell advisory board? And is it a good thing that you would suggest people might like to do? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So the Cornell advisory board consists of uh, alums and it's an advisory board to the dean of the law school. And this is something that maybe, I don't know how it is, in Japan, but certainly here in the U.S., the alumni play such a huge role in influencing educational institutions. Uh, first of all, alumni give a lot uh, of money mm -hmm. to the, the school, so they're financially very, very supportive of the, the school that they graduated from. And, you know, alums are generally very interested in making sure that their schools stay competitive. Also, especially for the law school alums, Many of these alums actually help the students find jobs, mm. whether be it uh, with their firm or, or otherwise. Mm. So there, the alums are not only, you know, supporters of the law school emotionally, but financially as well as from the, the professional career development perspective as well. So, of course, the law school wants to keep uh, a close contact with the advisory board members and what I bring, I think, to the advisory board is that I am the only member from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these members are partners in New York law firms. And how they see law school education may be very different from, for example, how I see law school education. So, and especially now that I'm part of uh, the, the management, that I'm no longer in private practice. Uh, for example, I see that there should be more courses on international private law or M&A, the importance of 
of lawyers learning accounting or just the numbers, maybe not creating spreadsheets, but understanding the numbers. So these are things that I, I, I talk about at these board meetings. So again, whether you are a member of a advisory board for a law school or a corporation, whatever, I think it's really your voice, it's something different that you're bringing, uh, some different perspective that you're bringing to the table that others may not actually have for the benefit of the organization, whether it be a, a corporation or a law school. Right. And being having been in-house, being a general counsel as well, that's probably something that the partners in the law firm who are also in the advisory board, they may not have had that experience exactly. as well. So you also bring exactly. that in as well, don't you? Right. Right. And then also would you be bringing in those teaching days that you had at KO and Hitotsubashi and those yes. experiences <laughs> as well, right? Because you had those tucked in as well into your career there. Yeah, exactly. So for example... I was part of the advisory board already for Cornell when Cornell formed an association with Keio Law School, when the law school system was first started mm, in Japan. Right. So from that perspective, I think, ah, during the Koizumi administration, right. there, there was all this uh, talk about uh, legal reform, including law school you know, reform or establishing law schools. And I did speak uh, in front of the Jiminto in terms of why. Japan needed to liberalize its uh, legal structure, legal system, including allowing foreign lawyers to become partners in Japanese law firms and uh, also uh, starting the, the law school system. So well, you did that. You spoke. Yeah. Well, we have a lot to owe you for <laughs> so much that you've done. That's amazing. Gosh. Thank you so much. And I also can't avoid talking about your singing. And I don't want to finish this recording without having asked you about your singing. And I know I'm flipping from talking about boards into singing, but I do. It is about your outside activities and networking and, and those passions that you have outside of your day job, shall we say, or day jobs. Passion for singing, where did that come from? You said you spoke about yeah, it from, I always when, loved from a singing. young age. Yeah, even in kindergarten, I just loved singing. <laughs> So, but how did you uh, know your voice would lend itself to the classical genre rather than anything else? I haven't asked you this question ever before. Well, that's actually, think. yeah, I mean, no, nobody actually has asked me that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I haven't actually sung any other genre, so hmm. maybe it's something that I should try. But I was fortunate enough to have a really good teacher in Los Angeles as a high school student. Uh, so it really started from there. And also it really started from because uh, my English was not good when I moved to the U.S. at the age of 14. It was singing was a way to communicate with others without really being able to speak English. So it was a way to make friends. I joined the chorus of uh, my high school, uh, things mm -hmm. like that. So it, it's been fantastic. Yeah, that is really, really nice. And when's your next concert? So my last concert was January last year. No. So right before the pandemic, I can't believe that uh, we were no. actually gathered in person back then. But, you know, in January, we weren't even worried about COVID here in New York. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have a, a recital at the uh, Wild Carnegie Hall. I'm hoping that I could do something next year, but uh, we'll see how things go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's wait and see. Hopefully you can. I, I look forward to hearing about that. And then you brushed, you brushed across the World Economic Forum status that you've received from them. You were named the Global Leadership Fellow. You went off to Davos. And then yes. you became a Global Leadership Fellow right after that, I think. And then you also became the global, Young Global Leader. That's what it was. Uh, yeah. Alongside Hiroshi Mikitani, the president of Rakuten and other Japanese people. And You've done so much there with the YGLs and starting that Beyond Tomorrow in 2011 and the Table for Two. How did all that come about? Is that also just through your activities you've been recognized um, and invited to Davos? I mean, that must have been an amazing experience. You know, so I definitely had a sponsor for that. Mm. I, don't, I don't know who that is. Oh, really? But I suspect that it was one of the professors who saw me teach. So right after I returned to Japan in 2000, I started teaching part-time at the Temple Law School of Japan. Right, Temple, yes. Yes, so there was a course called East-West Negotiation. 
Ooh. And it was actually a fun, really fun class, fun evening class. And I was teaching negotiation skills to these uh, American and, and Japanese students. And that led me to a stint at the uh, Hitotsubashi Business School, I think it was.、Mm. Uh, I don't think it was the law school, business school. I lectured at、uh, Hitotsubashi as well. I think one of the professors at Hitotsubashi who saw me. Thought that I would be a good candidate. And because he was、uh, on the advisory board for the World Economic Forum. Ah, wow. And so I think that's how it came about. Again, it's something that I think if, you, if you're passionate about something and if you're、mm. doing that and sort of spreading the word, those people will notice you.、Mm. And you had to give a speech there, didn't you? I had to give a speech there. And Klaus Schwab, Professor Schwab, is the founder of the World Economic Forum. And as he was presenting me or presenting all of us, you know, individually with these awards, you had to actually make a one minute speech on why you, you deserve to be、oh, on recognized. Oh, on the spot. On the spot. Why、oh, you deserve to be recognized as a global, so I think it was called the、oh. global leader for young globe, what is it called now? GLT, global leader for tomorrow. Right. And I said, well, I think I can do something for Japanese women working for Japanese corporations. Because certainly I was the only global leader for tomorrow from Japan being a woman.、Mm. And even the World Economic Forum generally, there weren't too many Japanese women aside from maybe Mrs. You know, Madame Ogata, Sadako Ogata, the, the High Commissioner for the Refugees. Uh, yeah. So I just felt that there were, there were so few Japanese women represented at the World Economic Forum. And if there's anything that I can do, then it's to advance Japanese women's position is not the right word, but you know, their position within Japanese companies. But it, I really do, you know, thank Professor Schwab for asking me that question because I never really thought about that. Why do I deserve to be called anything? And I think that question meant what's the purpose that you see for yourself? In your life. And that really, that, that's the question that really opened my eyes. And、uh, that's how I, I initiated the diversity program within Itochu. Because had it not been for that question, I would have been very happy just going along as a you know, good lawyer, pleasing my clients. But what is my bigger purpose in life is something that I never really thought about. Did he ask the same question to everybody, or was it different? I'm sure he did. I just don't remember anybody else's questions or their answers. I was so nervous. It's interesting, isn't it, how something like that so, became so significant? Yes.、Ooh. And actually, so there were three other Japanese、uh, Oki Matsumoto of、uh, mm. Manex,、mm. uh, jo- Joey Ito of,、uh, previously of、uh, the MIT Media Lab, and、uh, Mr. Domae, who recently was announced as to become、uh, head of Mujirushi Dohin. Those three were in the audience, and they were, I remember, you know, once I got off the stage, they were like clapping and they were like, you know, yeah. So it was a great experience. Wow, because you came back and then you formed the committee and you achieved the goals in order to, you know, show women, women's visibility within the company. And then that lead, led to the other programs that you started, right? Apart with the alum. Was it with those chaps who were in the audience? It wasn't the same people, but. Through, for example, James Kondo of the International House of Japan right now. But so James Kondo,、uh, Domai san that I just mentioned, who、yes. used to be with Uniqlo back then. So he's now with Muji, but he was with Uniqlo. And then another politician, Furukawa san of、uh, Nagoya,、mm-hmm. and, and myself, we were、mm-hmm. actually at another summit of the Young Global Leaders. And again, Professor Schwab said, well, we have to come up. With concrete projects. And so we were, those with ideas had to raise their hand.、Uh, and James Kondo was with the、uh, Public Health Organization of Japan、uh, back then. And he really wanted to do something with a, a balancing hunger on the one hand and obesity on the other hand.、Uh, how can you actually put in a system where you can virtually share a table? So, if you had too much on your plate at a table, you, and if the other person didn't have anything on his plate, you can say, Oh, have some of my meals. But how、mm-hmm. can you do that virtually?、Mm. So, that, that was his idea. And we needed a company cafeteria to try that out. 
So at Itochu, what we would do <laughs> is we would actually uh, have a meal that is fewer in calories than an ordinary meal. And that would actually cost 10 yen more. So the, the employees would be paying 10 yen more for to, if they were to pick that uh, particular meal. And Itochu would contribute match another 10 yen. So it would be 10, 20 yen from the meal. Right. And the 20 yen would then go to a program such as the... Uh, the table for board. two. Or, well, table for two. Well, it will go for table for two, and then right. table for two would then donate that donate to wow. meal programs. And table for two, the logo as well as the uh, the name was developed by Uniqlo. So it was you know Domai Sans Uniqlo, James Kondo's idea, Itochu's cafeteria, and then Furukawa-san, the congressman, was able to spread the, the word amongst the politicians. Wow, fantastic! The brains that come together and come up with something like that—is that still in existence? Yes, it is. Yeah, oh, is I mean, there is really? also a table for two USA as well. Whoa, that is really yeah. great. I hope this inspires people to think about these things. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I do want to shift gears because I do want to also know about your routine, Claire. How you start your day? It's morning there for you now. You wouldn't normally be on a podcast every day, but can you tell me how you start your day? And this is my first podcast <laughs> of my my life. So congratulations. Uh... <laughs> How do you start your day and what does it look like? Is it quite regular? Are you working later at night? What sort of rituals or things do you have within your day to keep your routine? So, I mean, of course, you know, COVID really made us think about our work mm, style. For sure. Yeah. So we are back into the office at least three times a week right now. Um, I'm actually going into the office uh, mostly every day, but uh, I get up around six o'clock. I recently bought an Alexa device. So the Alexa device wakes me up. <laughs> and I usually check email messages because uh, overnight uh, messages from Japan have come in. So I, I check my email messages as, as I eat my breakfast. And then I go to, to work around eight o'clock. It, it's very close by. And, and by the way, I buy coffee at the, the ground floor of the building. Mm. And just going back to this issue of mentorship or somebody yes. that you look up to. Yes. The person from whom I buy coffee every morning, she is just such a lovely person. She remembered my, my name immediately mm. and she knows what I want. So every single time as I'm walking up to the counter, she already has my coffee ready. Wow. <laughs> and her name's Elizabeth. Lovely. You know, that's the kind of person that I want to be as well. Mm. So it really doesn't matter whether it's the Madame Ogata's or Elizabeth's. If you see a person that you aspire, if you want to be like, try to copy the good qualities that they have. You don't have to look for somebody so special with a special title uh, to be your role model. But anyway, so I, 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 <laughs> I get coffee, go to work, and sometimes I have in-person meetings, but uh, oftentimes, you know, virtual meetings. Yes. And I come home around uh, five o'clock. I take a walk uh, around Central Park. Mm. And it's, it's very nice. Next Monday, my I'm a, an evening student at the uh, Juilliard Music School. Ooh. So my class is starting next week. Unfortunately, virtual still this semester, but uh, so I'll be singing from about 7 to 9 o'clock on Monday evenings. So that's my routine. Wow, that's fantastic. And so you actually can get away from the office at a, a regular time. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't mean that uh, I'm not off the computer, but no. still, uh, at least I'm uh, physically away from the office. And you're carving out time in the evening there for some joyful activities as well, which is just fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. And when you were going through your career, I'm going to ask you, but I ask lots of people, is the best piece of advice you had when you were starting out your career and, and also the worst? Being a, an associate in a law firm situation was very, very tough. It was very stressful. So it's not really a piece of advice, but mm -hmm. I think it was very important at that stage to be surrounded with people who really believed in you. So uh, it could be your, your family members or an organization outside of your corporation, but it's really good to have that uh, support network because it can really get you down. My associate days, a couple of the, a couple of years, were really, really very tough because we were just so busy with so few associates, so much work. 
Now you become worried when there's so few work, when there's、yes. so much work and so few associates. It can、mm. become really stressful too.、Mm. So it's not one piece of advice, but、uh, just really make sure that you have that support group to keep you going. And the worst advice would be not to have that, I would imagine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah.、Right. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a kind of a, a theme word that guides you each year, or do you have some kind of word of the year, for example? My, I mean, I do. Mine is intentional for this year. Wow. How about that? Do you have anything like that that guides you through the year? Well, I think it really depends. Now that、uh, I am. You know, responsible for my colleagues. It really depends upon where we are at any given moment. But you know, last year and this year, I established a, a slogan for the organization,、mm. and it is called a team journey. So you know, we were in a lockdown situation from March to June last year here in New York City. It was a very scary moment. So hard, wasn't it? You know, I said that early on that、uh, I can see Hudson River from here, but、yes. I also saw the The hospital, you know,、mm-hmm. vessel Comfort was docked right outside my apartment、mm-hmm. building. Central、mm-hmm. Park was turning into a hospital yard, and so my number one priority was how to really keep everybody safe. But it really had to be a team journey. So we were making these journeys together, even though through choppy waters. So we continued. We had the theme team journey. And we had certain guiding principles under Team Journey. For example, how we would stay、uh, as one team, despite the fact that some of us are coming into the office, others are working from home,、mm. uh, things like that. This year, I'm actually continuing on、uh, with Team Journey, but I also started another project called Project Vivaldi.、Mm. Uh, Vivaldi, of course, is the composer who wrote the Four yes. Seasons. Yes, and. The theme,、um, why I chose、uh, the project name as Project Vivaldi, is because I really want our employees to be well、uh, throughout all four seasons.、Mm. And by well, I mean physical well-being,、uh, emotional well-being, and financial well-being. Yeah, we have a project team journey still going on, but also Project Vivaldi. That is great. Thank you. You you answered. An amazing answer there with team journey. I just love that, especially since you had that happening outside your office window. Now、oh, you've got it was so scary <laughs> filming of a, a filming of a movie, but you've yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that was a not a movie. That was real life happening、yeah. right there. Well, Claire. I mean, is there anything else that we haven't covered today that you'd like to mention, or anything else you've said that you'd like to reemphasize? Well, of course, I didn't have a chance to ask you any questions. So next time, I'd like to <laughs> get your thoughts on many of these questions. Next time, indeed. Okay, there well, has to be got... a podcast on you. Yes, there has been one. Oh, there、uh, has been one. Okay. Must... Well, Angela Krantz, did you? Ah, yes. You know Angela.、Yes. Angela、yeah. turned the tables on me on episode ten of season one, and I、ah. was interviewed by her. So, oh, that's fantastic. That's something we can share with you later. Yes.、But、let's head into the final round, which is a quick fire round of about six or seven questions, which I ask each guest、uh, when we wind up the interview. And so the first question, and I think I might actually know the answer to this, but I, if I gave you one million yen in a cash, where would you spend it? Perhaps the equivalent in US dollars for you. W- would you have a favorite store or destination, or perhaps a cause that you would? Give that to. So it's actually not that much, if I may say so. Well, that's all、uh, I've got. That's all I've got to give you. But it's, it's, it's enough. It's enough. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Ah. Let's see. You could do some damage at a store if you. Yeah. Spend I'm actually not much of a shopper, but I guess I would travel. I would like Good, to. I mean,、yeah. we have been we have been away from traveling for so long. So、yeah. I'd like to travel. Where would you go? Well, of course, I'd like to go back to Japan, but、uh, aside from that, I'd like to I'd like to go back to Europe as well. My last trip was to to France. That was beautiful. Yeah.、Uh, or maybe even Ireland、oh, or Scotland. Great, great. I'd love to go there too. So, second question: Can you share the name of a book you've been reading? And maybe you haven't been listening to podcasts. I'm not sure, but the name of a podcast if you've been listening to one. Or perhaps just a book、uh, that you have read recently or are reading. 
So there is a book called uh, On Borrowed Time,、mm. and it's written by Graham Hall,、mm. H A L L. Yes, he、uh, he is an English writer, but he is somebody who was my colleague at Deakins in Hong Kong. So he's a he's a lawyer.、Mm. He's a lawyer turned writer. Nice, and it's actually about、uh, this mystery. Is、uh, it takes place in in Hong Kong and China, and it's very interesting. Sounds very interesting. There's a book on my bookshelf that's by Catherine O'Connell, but it's not me.、Yeah. <laughs> oh, <all> right. <laughs> I just bought it, so it sits on my shelf. <laughs> Hopefully, I can be like Graham one day and actually write one. Okay, so you're stuck on a desert island, Claire, and you need to bring one person, one item, and one food. Oh, that's really difficult. I mean, my husband is going to hate this, so hopefully he's not going to be listening to this. But I think I would say my mother, yes, because she is just my my greatest supporter、mm. in terms of food. Maybe some、Boy. home cooking.、Mm. Yeah, maybe some home cooking and drink. I just can't think of. I, I maybe lemonade. Good, that'll keep you refreshed. <laughs> is is there a famous person or celebrity you would love to meet or have met? Maybe downstairs at the Filming、uh, area there, but is there somebody famous you'd like to meet or have already met? I think I would like to meet Renee Fleming, the soprano singer. Of course, she's a wonderful singer, but I don't know if you've read her book. No, I haven't. I mean, it's not like fame came to her easily. She、mm-hmm. auditioned and auditioned and auditioned and was rejected so many times, and then finally, when she was about to give up, she was discovered. So she she's a very hardworking person and、uh, oh, somebody I would love to, love to meet. Wow, where is she? Is she American or is she she's 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 American? Yeah, she's American,、right. and、uh, I think she's、uh, maybe in Virginia these days. Wow, that's wonderful. And the last question is something about you that others don't know. Do you know that I'm a cat person? No, I didn't. I didn't know that at all. I, I, I know... love cats. I love oh, cats. Oh my goodness. And、uh, we used to cat sit for our friends、mm. here in、mm. New York. It was a Tonkinese cat called Sakura.、Uh, <laughs> very sweet. I just love cats, and、uh, I cannot wait to get cats one of these days. Fantastic! That is wonderful. Well, that finishes those questions. So, Claire, thank you very, very much for sharing your story today and telling us about your marvelous career. The wonderful. Balance of outside activities you have, and all of those things as you hold down those amazing top level jobs. It's been so lovely to connect with you again in this way today. Thank you very, very much, Catherine. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. And if people would like to connect with you, how do they do that? Is it better to do that through me, or would you like them to connect with you on LinkedIn? Uh, I'm not very good with LinkedIn, but they they <laughs> certainly can if they if they want to. That's great.、Uh, well, I'd like to finish it up there. We've had this fantastic conversation about your impressive career, and you really are showing that lawyers can go to that pinnacle of an organization and use their legal skills and experience to lead an organization as yet another way to lead a lawyer life. And so I'm really grateful that you've come on as my second guest in the second season of Lawyer on Air. And thank you for sharing your journey; it's been very inspiring. And for、thank、all you, of the、Catherine. listeners, yeah, thank you for all of the listeners. Please do listen to this episode, subscribe, and do drop us a short review because that does help. For lawyer on air to be seen and heard by more people, we're also now on our own YouTube channel as well, so you can listen to us there, and you can go onto my web page and、uh, leave me a voicemail. I'd really love to hear you do that. So thank you very very much, everyone, and for listening and to Claire again,、uh, and I hope that everyone has enjoyed and are inspired again to live a wonderful lawyer lady life. Thank you, Claire, and. That's all now. Thank you, and see you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer on Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard, and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. 
And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer On Air. Cheers, kampai, and bye for now.